open data sets. And the second problem is there's also inconsistency between the representation of the data set format. And the last one, the third one is there's uh, the, the format uh, are also inconsistent when we uh, write the data consumption code, for example, in, in, in data set visualization, in data training, uh, you know, running statistics on the data and, and doing uh, real-time inference and evaluation. So on the, on the left bottom corner, we actually show a graph and, and this is exactly uh, how it works today where, you know, uh, Coco and VOC and Kitty and Cityscapes, they're all really famous data sets. Uh, in the platform, uh, we thought it will be a great idea to give back to the community by open up the capability, by open up the platform to the entire community, uh, you know, to the people who want to share their open data uh, they want to find a place to host their open data for free. And we want to give back to the community by open uh, this platform for everyone who actually want to have. We're still working really hard to working on that part and, and to build a community around open data. Uh, along the way, we actually encounter a bunch of uh, different hurdles, uh, you know, including the issues on the open data licensing, uh, open data standards, and some of the other problems. Uh, that's why we created uh, Project OpenBytes in 2021. Uh, we are aiming to use uh, this form of organization to uh, bring together all the people who care, who care about the development of AI, who care about open data sets together uh, to uh, kind of trying to solve all the problems uh, you know, that blocking, making uh, open data sets more available and, and uh, more accessible. Mm -hmm. We also encouraging different organizations of any sizes to share their data. So the researchers and other industry practitioners can use that data to do their innovative jobs. Uh, you can always reach me at my working email, uh, which is edward.trey at gravity.com. Uh, you can also follow me on LinkedIn and, and Twitter. So in my today's talk, I uh, actually have a, a relative you know, short agenda. Uh, in the first section, I'm going to share uh, with you guys the, the challenges uh, we have when we're working on the open, open data sets platform. And then uh, after that, we're going to share, uh, you know, our thoughts behind uh, how to solve those challenges. Uh, our proposed solution is to uh, have a unified uh, representation for the entire AI community to work with all different types of data sets. Uh, the next section, the third section, uh, we're going to talk about Portex, uh, which is a, a schema definition language uh, we de developed in-house. Uh, we already uh, open source it uh, to the entire community uh, to try to trying to solve those challenges. Um, and then uh, the next section, we're going to share about the uh, roadmap we have for Portex. And at the end, we kind of want to talk about, you know, I, as a, a member in the community, how you can participate. Uh, helping us to uh, make Portex better and helping us to make open data sets more accessible and available to all the members uh, in the entire community. So the first section, uh, we want to share about the challenges we observe when working with the open data sets. Uh, let me give a quick introduction of the current state of the open data sets. When we building this open data set platform, we actually have three major issues. The number one is we found oftentimes uh, there's inconsistencies uh, within the data formats from all different type of open data sets. And the second problem is there's also inconsistency between the representation of the data set format. And the last one, the third one is there's uh, the, the format uh, are also inconsistent when we uh, write the data consumption code, for example, in, in, in data set visualization, in data training, uh, you know, running statistics on the data and, and doing uh, real-time inference and evaluation. So on the, on the left bottom corner, we actually show a graph and, and this is exactly uh, how it works today where, you know, uh, Coco and VOC and Kitty and Cityscapes, they're all really famous data sets. Uh, in computer vision. Uh, the problem is they all have totally different formats. Uh, they all have totally different definition of how their data organized. So when we're working on visualization for those data sets, when we're working on the model training code, the evaluation code, we have to customize uh, those visualization for each different specific uh, data set definition. And that basically create a huge hustle for uh, developers to uh, actually understand what's inside the data, uh, you know, the relationship between the data sets. Uh, and also it's really hard to build scalable software, which will work uh, for, you know, which will work for all data. 
and it's hard to share the code that process the data because you have to do the data you either have to do the data conversion or you have to retrofit the model to uh, the specific format defined uh, in that data set and neither case is ideal so uh, let's give you guys a much in-depth uh, overview of uh, what are those three issues are. The first issues uh, we are talking about the, incons the inconsistency between the data formats. Uh, let us to use VOC, Coco, and Kitty as the example. First of all, first of all, they, you can see they're all save the data in, uh, especially the annotation in all different formats. For VOC, we have the XML, and for Coco, we have JSON, uh, and we have JSON. For Kitty, we actually have a text file. And then for the first two, you can looking at the uh, the data uh, itself. Uh, by looking at the field the names, uh, you know, of the field, you can actually guess what's going on inside the data. But for Kitty, uh, without reading the documentation, you basically don't know uh, what is uh, what each field actually mean. Um, and then what funny thing is, uh, even for the same type of object, for example, you know, in in uh, computer vision object detection, we always use bounding box to represent where the objects are. Uh, and even for the uh, for the same bounding boxes, we could have different type of definitions. For example, like we will see, I actually use the laptop top, top corner uh, plus the right bottom corner, right? That's why it has X mean, Y mean, uh, and X max and Y max. Uh, in some of the other definition, I actually use the center of the bounding box plus the width and the height of the bounding box. And in other definition, I actually use the left corner uh, of the uh, left, top left corner of the bounding box and plus the height and width uh, of the bounding box to represent the bounding box. And, and uh, some, sometimes the, the, the width and the height, uh, there are ac actually in different scales. Sometimes uh, people use absolute pixel values and sometimes people use uh, a relative um, scale of ratio uh, from zero to one to represent you know, how big the bounding box are uh, relative to the, the image itself. So um, it, it's actually really hard to keep track of, uh, you know, what's going on inside of each definition. Sometimes you have to always go back to the, you know, to the documentation page and, and trying to figure out, you know, uh, what's actually inside the data. So you'll be able to write code that can consume the data. And the second issue is there's definitely inconsistent format representation. Uh, beyond you know the different definition for the same object, the bonding boxes, uh, there's also other ways to uh, to kind of get more information about what the data set has and uh, you know what the specific data set means. Uh, on the left hand side, we we show you how Coco give that information uh, to the developers. Uh, it actually has a, a data format page uh, where it kind of give a very detailed explanation of uh, what what they use uh, in their JSON and what what's different, uh, what uh, what uh, each different field actually mean and what information it actually contain. On the right hand side, uh, we basically show you uh, the documentation for Kitty. Uh, for Kitty, it actually has an entirely separate system where you have to go to the documentation and look at the documentation to understand uh, what each number actually mean in their TST file. Uh, the problem with this type of definition is. Uh, Inconsist inconsistency between the documentation and the data itself is relatively easy. It happens all the time. For example, sometimes the people, when they uh, explore the data and save it uh, into a TST file, they, they, they forget about you know, updating the documentation. And, and uh, we saw that inconsistency all the time. And sometimes we have to, when we process the data, it, it doesn't look right and we have to go back and, and email the you know the the users the contributor of the data set and ask them like well, hey what's going on inside your data it doesn't uh, seem to be right and uh, and 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 uh, it's, it's also hard for them to kind of keep tracking of what's going on and sometimes they get back to us and say hey uh, yes yeah, so indeed wrong and then you have to you know rate the data in this way uh, it doesn't really show up in the documentation and creates a huge problems. And the number, uh, the number three problems we have are, you know, when we consume the data, uh, you know, uh, some of the model we don't always design the model from scratch, right? Some of the model are designed by uh, some really uh, talented researchers, uh, either from academia or in the industry. We want to use their model as uh, the bare bone. Uh, for our own applications, right? We go to GitHub to find such models. But those models, they are all kind of require different specific format to train. For example, Euro V5, they actually require the Cocoa format. 
the swing transformer v2 required image net format the list uh, goes on and on and and, um, and when you uh, organize your model when you organize your data in a different ways it's sometimes kind of hard to reuse uh, the model uh, trained on, on other specific types um, and then uh, to solve these problems, we we saw in the industry or in the academia, uh, people are writing a lot of boilerplate code to do data conversion. For example, BDD 100K uh, actually provide a toolkit to convert data to Cocoa and scalable uh, formats. Uh, and then, um, you know, if you search on GitHub, you can actually find really a bunch of tons of GitHub repos are talking about uh, converting VOC, uh, you know, the data format to Coco and, and vice versa, right? Converting to Coco back to VOC. Uh, and if we uh, keep, you know, creating new type of formats and, and this list will, will go on, on and on and, and forever. Uh, that definitely creates a lot of problems when we uh, sharing the data, sharing the code uh, that process the data. So how should we solve those challenges? Um, we the source we have is we definitely should have a unified representation uh, for all the data sets. Uh, if we have that, we we can solve this uh, this hurdle, these challenges. So, what is a unified representation? I think it has two parts. Uh, the first part is uh, we have to define a unified data structure that is shareable, that is reusable. And it should has much better readabilities. For example, it shouldn't be like a TXT file with a bunch of numbers. Uh, when you just open the file, you have no idea what's actually going on inside that file, right? And and uh, the second part is uh, we need to have a unified in memory and on disk layout. So we write in the code, we can guarantee the code will work correctly. Um, and then we can actually share that code between you know different different people between different organizations. So. Uh, what benefit uh, from a unified representation? Uh, we, we believe that's the reusability and the shareability because right now, like training a model is super expensive. When we're talking about GPT, uh, when we're talking about uh, other big models, right? Uh, it just consumes a lot of power, a lot of time to train, right? Uh, so maximize the reusability, maximize the uh, shareability is definitely uh, go alongside with the spirit of open source. Um, and then uh, we kind of use the same graph in the previous section uh, to show once we have a unified representation, we can make the data consumption much easier, right? We, we can have unified visualization that can be used to visualize uh, the data, not only from Coco, but also from uh, VOC and KD and Cityscape. Um, well, at least the object detection part should be the same, right? And then uh, we can share the processing code, we can share the model training code, we can share the inference code. Uh, but uh, this is good. This is great. This is nice, right? But uh, why don't we use exist existing solutions? What make the existing solutions don't work in those scenarios? Uh, in this section, I can uh, I want to give you guys an example, and and that basically shows why the existing solution doesn't work. Uh, when, no matter whether it's JSON or other type of interface definition language, uh, we in this section we actually use the VOC dataset and, and dogs and cat versus cat dataset as the example we use. Uh, for example, we use protobuf to uh, to be the, the IDL to define the, the schema for the data because it's actually strongly type is slightly better than uh, XML and, and JSON. Um, and then uh, for protobuf on the left hand side is the definition of the VOC data set uh, in protobuf. And then uh, if we want to, to be honest, like uh, the VOC data set and, and dog versus cat data set, they basically are the same task. They are, they are both computer uh, vision tasks. They're both object detection tasks. The only differences between those two data sets are uh, on the left hand side, the VOC data set has a lot of categories. It has a lot, a lot of uh, you know, classes for different types of objects. But on the right hand side, the, the dog and cat they only have two categories, the cat and dog. And other than that, it's pretty much the same. The, the data are organized in the same way, right? But uh, reuse the definition is hard though. For example, VOC sits in its own GitHub repo. It has, let's say, it has this perfect protobuf definition. Uh, but if you want to use in the dog versus cat scenario, you have to fork uh, that GitHub repo to to your local, and you have to copy the protobuf definition files to your local uh, working directory, and then you open up that file and modify. The necessary field to match your requirements and, and delete the, the unnecessary fields, right? 
And then by doing so, saving that back to some other protobuf definition file and, and putting term repo on GitHub, there's basically no link between you know, those two. You can never know uh, whether the, those two type of data sets, they are actually uh, using a similar file structure. Uh, and then you basically can reuse a lot of the code uh, that was, uh, you know, was created for the VUC data set on, directly on the dog versus cat data set, right? Because there's no uh, link between the two other than you open up uh, both of the, the protobuf definition manually and can, kind of compare uh, the, the code inside those files and be able to figure out, ah, they are actually sharing the same structure. The data are actually organized the same way and the dog and cat uh, data set are probably borrow uh, the definition from the VOC, right? And, and that's the problem we are having uh, in uh, in the industry right now. If we use any type of the uh, current uh, solution to store this type of data, uh, the problem will be uh, no one will know exactly where they come from, uh, and then uh, no one will know, you know, uh, whether it's from the existing data set, whether we can reuse uh, some of the existing code, existing model, and, and, uh, and make it super efficient because the developers, the, the researchers, they have to write their own code again and again and again. And that doesn't really create much uh, value. Uh, it's not, not a good use of their time. So uh, here is a, uh, I just want to go, go through a quick list of uh, what we think the issues are with the current solutions. Uh, you know, we, we definitely need a unified representation, but the current solutions has a lot of limitations on that. The first limitation is a lacking of reusability and shareability. Uh, for example, the VOC definition cannot be shared with other people. Other people cannot import that definition or import part of the definition and use it in their uh, own projects and be able to leverage the uh, code that uh, written for uh, you know, part of that uh, part of that definitions, right? Uh, and then the second issue is uh, it actually does not support parameterization uh, when mod when modifying the type. So what do I mean by parameterization? For example, in the VOC, we have many different categories, right? And then for the uh, dog versus cat, we only have two categories. Is that possible for for us to share the backbone uh, of the definition of the data set instead we only to modify the part that's are different? Um, it's impossible with JSON, it's impossible with protobuf, uh, it's also impossible with uh, XML. So, uh, well, it's, it's impossible in, in a manner where, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's impossible in a manner that, you know, we can define, uh, you know, some base types and, and uh, every application specific types, we can just instantiate uh, that base types with application specific uh, you know, data structures. Uh, and the third one is uh, there's no hard guarantee for a lot of the, the types, the formats we use to store, to store the structured data, to store the open data set, for example, JSON and, and XML and text file. You can only put very simple string data or numbers uh, inside those definitions. And, and, and uh, none of those uh, definition or technology are strongly typed so you don't have any guarantee beyond you have to uh you know ask the user to be really careful when they're writing the data to those documents or you have to write uh, you know a lot of the code that capture all different color cases um you don't you never you will run to all different issues when you consume that data at scale because there are going to be so many corner cases you have to uh, interrupt the workflow and and capture and write code to capture all those uh cases one by one and the last one is uh, it's also really hard to store uh, relative complex data. For example, like uh, sometimes the um, the data annotation is not is not as simple as a bounding box, right? You have many different objects, you have many different tables, uh, you have uh, many different properties, and you want to uh, they are all kind of related to each other, but they don't uh, the dimensionality doesn't really match with each other. You have to store. Uh, sometimes you have to store those data into separate tables. And, and when you query the data, you will do a lot of the joint operations uh, to assemble the data together again and be able to consume the data. For example, uh, Nielsen's is uh, one of the case, uh, you know, in these scenarios, I actually uh, use uh, relational tables to define the entire data set. And every time you want to search a part of the data set, you have to uh, basically do, uh, do a lot of joint queries. Um, and then uh, that's uh, that's not really convenient for a lot of the uh, for, for a lot of the use cases. 
so what's our solution? What's, uh, what's the solution we propose under the project of open base or within gravity? Uh, that is Protex. Uh, we are designing a new uh, schema definition language uh, for data sets. Uh, if you want to curious about the Protex, the, the syntax and language itself, please go to uh, our documentation site and, and learn more about it. In my opinion, uh, is uh, is pretty elegant, and, and you can actually use this definition in many different places. Um, so, what is Portex? Let me give you a quick introduction of the Portex uh, schema definition language. Portex is a unified schema definition language. What do we uh, what do we mean by unified schema definition language? There's actually two folds. One is unified. It's not only designed for the data annotations, but it's also designed to uh, you know, for the raw data, for the metadata associated with the raw data, the images, the audios, the, the text, uh, and, and the camera parameters, uh, the, the LiDAR parameters, the LiDAR calibration parameters, the intrinsics, the intrinsics, uh, the LP, uh, you know, vocabularies. You can basically put any type of data from the raw data to its annotations, to its metadata, all in the same format and all, man all managed in the same way. And the entire community can be able to reuse uh, any part of it. And the second part, uh, when we call it is a schema definition language, we basically uh, envision we want to you know, save the data in a columnar way where uh, you can imagine the data will be saved into a huge table. And then uh, we use Portex to basically define what are the each columns and what type of data people can save in each of the columns. And each of the columns can be expanded into another table uh, into multiple, uh, you know, uh, other columns, uh, and and that's pretty much the goal. Uh, we want to have this system where we can store very complex data all together. Uh, the, we can use this Portex to describe the entire data set, not only the annotation. Um, and why is that? And why this Portex is, uh, is important is helpful because that kind of enable the reusability and the shareability of of uh, the data set definitions, which further will enable shared data processing and model training code, uh, which is going to be really helpful for the entire community uh, kind of to collaborate on building the models and sharing the models, sharing the knowledge, uh, and, and collectively we can be better. So here are some of the key features of Portex. The first of all, like all the types in Portex are, cons are composable. Uh, and we have a type import mechanism which work with GitHub repo. Uh, in your GitHub repo, you can create a folder or the entire GitHub repo, you can make that be a, um, uh, be a place to store uh, the definition of some of the existing Portex formats. And then in your, in your other work, you can always in, uh, import a tab from an existing GitHub repo. I can show you some of the syntax. It's really simple, it's easy, it's elegant. Uh, you can import a GitHub and, and any types uh, within a GitHub repo. Uh, it's kind of really similar to uh, to Python packages. Uh, so the second feature is uh, we we provide a templating feature where uh, we can uh, you know define the 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 bare bone of uh, some data types and uh, use templates to initiate uh, the data structure uh, for different applications uh, with a specific definition of the field. Um, for example, uh, I, I uh, in the you know, uh, we'll give you details uh, in, in the next few slides. Uh, and then the third one is we want to uh, be able to support a multi-dimensional table, which basically means we can put another table into each cell uh, of the of the um, of the tabular uh, data model, and we can put all the complex data together. So we don't have to have multiple tables and have to have the data scattered into the multiple tables. And and when we do queries, we we use the uh, re relational database way to do a lot of join and, and that first of all that's not efficient and second of all like uh, that will easily create data inconsistency uh, between those tables so let me just give you a quick example on how the info work uh, so on the left hand side you can see if you want to define a bounding box uh, Type of data structure you can create a file uh, which we call VOC box 2D and uh, all the Portex uh, schema definition are put into YAMLs uh, and then you can see we we give it a type called uh, record a record in Portex basically means it's an object uh, it's really similar to struct uh, in C++ uh, it's really similar to object in Python and then uh, under that object you can have a bunch of fields for example the record uh, for uh, 
you know, for example, like the really important fields for, for a bounding box are the X means, the Y means, the X max and Y max. And then for each different field, you can actually assign a type and all the types are, are all the data will be checked against the type. In this very example, the types are integer 32, which basically means they actually use uh, the pixel values for the uh, for the x mean and y mean are not a ratio value, uh, and then uh, let's say you in your next project uh, you want to import this definition and this definition is sitting in some GitHub repo, and then you can just do a simple report just like Python code, right? You can do a simple report and say, hey, I want to import this repo and I want to import this type in this repo. Uh, you can import as many types as you want uh, from a specific repo, and you can import. Uh, types from multiple different repos. And then in your main body, you can actually use uh, that type. Uh, for example, here, right here, uh, we have a field which called objects, uh, which is array. Uh, and then uh, and then each uh, item of that array is a, a bounding box, a 2D bounding box. And, and uh, for each of the objects and each field, you can basically view that as a column. The object itself could be a column, right? And then you can expand that and each of the field could be a column too. Think about uh, if you have a data set that has images, that has bounding boxes, and you can actually put them together um, uh, in, in different columns. So the second uh, feature is the template feature, uh, which is really similar to C++ template. Uh, in, in, in this section, I will bring back the uh, VOC data set versus the uh, dog versus cat data set um, you know, example. Uh, in here, on the left-hand side, we actually can define a, a backbone uh, for uh, VOC box 2D, uh, which basically has, you know, two uh, parameters. Uh, it's an object, right? It's a record object. It has two parameters. One is category. You know, the, the category will be different and attribute. That attribute will be different for different applications. And then in, in the specific applications, uh, you can import uh, that, uh, variable, uh, which I, I totally ignore because I, you know, I can't uh, write a lot of code in my slide. Uh, but in this definition, if you want to uh, define a VOC-like type of uh, data structure, you can just say, hey, the categories should be airplane, bicycle, uh, boat, whatever, you know, uh, the data was, that the category is defined in VOC. And then for the attributes part, you can define something like post, right? Uh, uh, whether it's, um, uh, whether it's on, on the right, whether it's on the left, uh, and, and, and some of the uh, some of the other fields that the VOC dataset really cares. And for the dog and cat dataset, you can uh, instantiate the, the, the backbone with only two classes, only two categories. One is cat, the other one is dog. And then uh, you can also uh, specify the attributes. The only uh, important attributes for this data set may be whether you know the object is occluded and it's a boolean, uh, it's a boolean uh, number variable. And for multi-dimensional tables, um, it's relatively easy to define, right? Um, when you when all the types are composable, you can basically uh, compose very complex types together, for example, like the image tab uh, could have uh, the raw data itself, the, the binary image itself, alongside with the metadata, the camera information, um, some other information, when the timestamp, when it was captured, uh, and, and other things like that, right? And, and for the box 2D, uh, for each of the images, you basically have a unlimited uh, lots of boxes, objects inside the images, it could be one, it could be two, it could be like 10 or 100, right? Uh, and then you can actually put that array, another table uh, inside the cell. And organizing that is relatively easy by, uh, you know, using the Portex schema definition. On the left, on the left hand side, uh, we basically show you um, when we actually putting the data into this schema, what it looks like, right? It has the file names, a bunch of strings, it has the images, and it has the binary data. And for the bounding box, it basically has another table. Um, in this way, we don't really need to save the data into separate different tables. Uh, we can put every single data all together and to make sure the consistency of the data. So uh, Portex is great, right? Uh, what can happen next to Portex? Uh, right now, we are working on the main uh, syntax of Portex uh, is uh, WIP. Um, and then uh, 
we almost reached the, the end of the first release. Uh, the, the documentation side is, is up and running. Feel free to check out the documentation and learn more about Portex and give us the feedback whether you like it or not. Uh, the official uh, public release will be in July and, and uh, please behold and, and we'll uh, make some noise when we uh, want to officially launch it. And we are also in the meantime working on some in-memory representations because uh, the schema definition language only uh, kind of define, you know, how data being organized, uh, you know, what type of data inside this data set. But when we're working with the data set, we actually need to put into the numbers, right? And it has to have a in-memory representation, uh, which make it more useful, for, uh, more easier to be accessed and pretty, uh, you know, processed by different, different uh, code and scripts. And, and with this effort, we are currently converting, you know, the data set to a very popular uh, in-memory format, which is Apache Arrow. Uh, it uh, is a columnar, uh, in-memory columnar store, uh, in, in, in-memory columnar type of uh, data format, uh, where, where it's really maximized for uh, a lot of analytic jobs. And if you don't want to use the raw Apache Arrow format, we also provide you with uh, in-memory APIs um, like DataFrame. We, we follow the Pandas DataFrame API and uh, kind of re-implement re this DataFrame so you can uh, use the DataFrame API and the, the, the features you are already familiar with uh, to work with the, the data defined by the Portex schema. And in the future, we, we are thinking about, you know, writing a compiler uh, to automatically generate code, uh, you know, specific code for specific schemas, uh, and and user can use that code in different applications. For example, like in the Python, they can use that code to read the data, feed that into a training process, and and uh, maybe when they build visualization, they can uh, generate JavaScript code and, and be able to read the data and put that into really nice visualization plugins. And that plugins can be can be shared, uh, you know, with different parties. For example, the bonding box, right? All the bonding box are looking the same. We can just write once uh, what the bonding box visualization are, and every time if we see that specific type, and the, the visualization will understand how it can process that data, be visualized that data to the users. And and we're trying to uh, make a compiler to compile the. Uh, the schema definition to the Portex schema into many, many different languages. So uh, when people building uh, different uh, applications in different languages, they are able to consume that data. And then uh, in the last section, in the section five, we want to touch base on uh, how we want to work with the community, how the community members can participate in this great journey. There's multiple ways people can uh, contribute. The first way is to participate in the Portex language design. We are still designing a language. Uh, we have some really great features. We want to add more uh, so we can adopt more and more open data sets. Uh, feel free to go to our GitHub repos. And, and if you want to uh, implement some feature yourself, feel free to send the, the pull request. Uh, if you want to uh, see some feature happening with Portex, feel free to uh, you know, uh, send uh, a ticket in the issues section and let us know what features you require the most. Uh, we'll, we'll arrange time to put it into the roadmap of Portex in the future. And then also you can contribute uh, on the Portex schema side uh, when you're working on new open data sets. Uh, feel free to uh, leave a folder that use Portex to define the format. You'll find it super useful for, uh, for you to actually leverage some of the existing technology uh, when process the data, but it's also going to be helpful for other users who kind of want to uh, import your definition in their own works, extend your definitions in their own works, uh, and be able to use part of your definition and part of the, the tr tool chain you already built. Uh, and the last one is uh, we want more models to use Portex schema. Uh, we want more data processing code be able to benefit from Portex schema. So feel free to uh, you know, we, we already have a, a product schema common uh, repo where we have defined some of the common data types. Uh, feel free to share the code that use those uh, product schema. Feel free to share the models that use the product schema. Uh, and, and you can help us to put some classic models, uh, you know, into product schema. So the model itself uh, can be reused in many situations as long as 
you know, some of the other data sets use the same Vortex schema. Um, so um, always feel free to uh, track out the contribution, uh, contributing page uh, of our GitHub repo, and feel free to reach out to us, to, to me, to myself, to uh, follow us on LinkedIn, follow OpenBytes on LinkedIn, follow Gravity on LinkedIn, and then uh, follow us on Twitter. And, and we'll be happy to uh, talk with any uh, people who uh, want to uh, join the journey, want to participate in this effort. And that's pretty much conclude my, uh, my, my speech today, my presentation today. Uh, wish you all have fun at OSS Summit and hopefully we'll see each other um, in the near future. Thanks. This is Edward speaking.